Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests are comedian actor A.J. Jamal and artist designer Sherry Wolf. Sherry grew up in a suburb of Baltimore, Maryland. She was a shy, quiet student who took honors anyway in her high school class. She graduated magna cum laude from the University of Maryland's Fine Arts program. Fresh out of college, Sherry landed a job with David Brinkley of the NBC Nightly News. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Tell us what you did for David Brinkley. Well, I was uh, the first woman artist to work in that capacity at, at um, NBC Nightly News, doing the portraits for the news for David Brinkley. I would be painting celebrities and political figures that were projected behind uh, David Brinkley and John Chancellor in the news. What did you do? Did you have to actually um, do the painting and then they... They, right away. <laughs> it was very quick. They would put together the stories and then uh, I'd have a few hours in the afternoon to, after they decided which stories were, were going to be on the air, I would have to do these these um, detailed paintings. So were the, would you call them more illustration or fine art at that point? Well, what I, those were more illustration. The fine art had to do with paintings that I did on my own, of, of my own um, ideas, creative ideas. So you were actually painting your own paintings and then doing these illustrations for exactly for the news. Right. You also did illustrations for Time Magazine, National Geographic, the New York Times, I'm trying to remember, Simon and Schuster. A lot, yes. And, and, Album cover, everything. And what were those? Were those illustrations or fine art? Those were illustrations. Uh, like a Time Magazine would come to me and say, I, I need a painting of uh, Ronald Reagan for a cover of, a mag of, of Time, or Caroline Kennedy, I need her to look uh, this way and, and do that illustration for the cover of that magazine. So it was, it was fun, it was exciting as a beginning. What would the difference between illustration and fine art be in your mind? Well, illustrations are the commissions from you know, publications and um, that where they would tell me exactly what they wanted and I would do those, those paintings or renderings, whatever they needed. And how uh, long would that take? Uh, it, it depended on, on their tight schedule, and usually for a publication, sometimes it was very tight. Uh, a lot of times I would get called it Friday afternoon, I need a painting by Monday morning, so there'd be no sleeping. I would be working straight through the weekend. But was that the same situation at the nightly, at the nightly news, or well, was it faster? It was fast. Both, all of it was fast. You usually didn't have a tremendous amount of time, and I had to make it look perfect. And tell us about fine art. How, what do you, what's the difference in well, that? Well, the fine art, after I um, ended or wound down my my illustrating career because I always wanted just to be able to paint, which is a luxury for most artists. And, and fortunately, I had the opportunity to just stop illustrating and to get involved in, in doing my own paintings. So I came up with different series and different ideas and concepts, and I would just sit in my studio and, and paint. Is the uh, material different? For illustrations and for fine art well, that you uh, would use? No, I basically use the same thing, a, acrylic on canvas. Even for the illustrations? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's surprising. Yes, yes. I would think they would be paper pieces. Um, most of them were, unless they were uh, pen and ink or, or pencil, but most of the uh, illustrations that, that I commissioned by the, by the magazines were in, in paintings. I see. Well, you're a great... Um, uh, believer in super realism and we have a tape that shows you in your studio uh, painting so let's sure. watch Sherry Wolf in her studio. It takes um, uh, almost six months to a year to complete each painting and it's just many many hours of labor there's no way of rushing the technique it's just very difficult each area is very difficult to finally create that, that lifelike effect that I'm trying to achieve. So it's, it's a very demanding style. 
when I paint, everything is in sharp focus. And I can do so much to change the lighting and enhance upon things that cannot exist in reality. Sherry, those were huge paintings. How did you ever attack a canvas like that? Well, I had um, two easel systems. One was in my New York apartment. I would press a button and the chair would move up and down. And I would press another button and it was, everything was motorized. The painting would move up and down. And in my other studio in Maryland, I have a, um, uh, a painting. I press a button and it's motorized also, but the painting goes into the floor to the next level down. And, and it'd be able to just, you know, just with the touch of a finger, move it back and forth. And my whole lighting set up. Because yeah. what were the size of those canvases? They were approximately six by seven feet. So they were large. They were very big. Large. Did you paint from life or did you use photographs or? Um, both. Mostly from photographs. I would set up the, the scene and then take a series of photographs mm. and then play around with that afterwards. Do you still do that? Yes, yes. Well, it's very, it's, it's very <laughs> time consuming. Each painting takes at least a, a year to do it. To do a major painting, it takes a year. It's amazing because you did a series of Hollywood uh, paintings, and I think we also get to see that. You brought a tape of that. Yes. So let's watch that. That was a series I painted in the mid '70s. It was uh, six Hollywood celebrities: Humphrey Bogart, and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, stars like that and I was painting the fantasy of, of Hollywood and it's that glamour that I was trying to to really portray on the canvas. So when you come to Hollywood you get to visit those portraits. Yes. <laughs> now one other thing that I forgot to mention was Trisha Nixon's wedding. Tell us about that story. Well, while, while I was living in Washington I was commissioned by the White House to do six paintings of Trisha Nixon for her wedding, and um, it was very interesting. I was able to um, sketch the rose garden and do some preliminary work, so I was able to walk around the White House, and it was. It was a I wonder. Occasion. I wonder if Trisha Nixon had any influence on you going into your scarf collection because she always used to wear a scarf yes. around her neck. Uh, mine was much <coughs> more whimsical scarves. The scarves that had. Um, hand pockets and, and zipper leather pockets on the end of it, or or appliques of parrots and different birds, which you know I use a lot in my different jewelry imagery. But did that just uh, doing accessories just come by chance? I always I always love designing. I feel like I I have ideas for all kinds of products. I see. So you name it, I have designed in, in my head products for everything from dinnerware to ties to sheets. Uh, so I'm going to name jewelry now because jewelry. That's, that's, your, what I'm doing right <laughs> that's what you're doing now. Exactly. So tell us about your jewelry line. Well the jewelry is a fine jewelry collection and it's, um, it's a sort of a fantasy collection and it's uh, um, one part of it is, is interchangeable where you can take these different charms, or the, I call them sort of sculptural charms because they're three-dimensional and you can wear them on your bracelet or necklace or earrings. So there's a, it's very versatile and a person can create their own look, which I think is very important in today's world. You were talking about wearing one or clipping one to a lapel or doing different things like that with it. Right. And, right. and who shows that jewelry? It'll be at Neiman Marcus. Exclusively? Exclusively at Neiman Marcus. Well, they have very good taste. Yes, I, I love uh, our, our Neiman Marcus. <laughs> our Neiman Marcus is great in Beverly Hills. It but um, tell us a little bit about what influences you. You said these look like animals, but they really don't look like animals. Yeah, well, they are. They're, they're, um, uh, when I look at them, I, I see different things every time. I, I, and I created them, and I see different things. I'll take a... Um, a lion, and I'll, as as you twirl around, the, and I, I designed it so these animals are able to you know twirl on the ride, and uh, the back has a coiled tail and and different different elements just to make it you know very uh, fantasy like. Do you have to make a lot of personal appearances when you sell your jewelry, or is that not part of the deal? Personal appearances are, you know, are part of the deal, <laughs> and I love to meet the public, and I love to show the jewelry. That's it, what I was going to ask you. How do you know? Are you designing for the client, or are you designing for yourself? 
I design with people in mind all the time because I, do, I never design, I, I paint paintings for myself or for the concepts that I have in my head and that's a totally different thing than when I design for products for people because I'm a consumer and I, would, uh, and I want something that's beautiful and I, um, so I, and I think of you know, what other people would like. What is in your line of jewelry? Earrings? Earrings, pins, necklaces, bracelets, everything. Every, it, runs uh, the gamut? Uh, runs the entire gamut. <laughs> when um, we, we talked about it, you were, and you said you were a consumer, could anyone afford this or is it really too expensive for people to? No, I've tried to make this very affordable. And it's still, it's 18 karat gold with precious stones. So I'm using the best materials and, and, and having it made the, the finest way possible. Um, uh, but the, I'm trying to keep the prices where uh, someone who who wants to just to begin collecting can start with buying one piece and then can add uh, to their collection. That's a great idea. So then, are they signed? Yes. So, <laughs> so everyone can have a Sherry Wolf exactly. in their in their collection. Right. What is going to be your next endeavor, Sherry, after the jewelry line? Well, uh, the jewelry I'll concentrate on for a while because I have a lot of ideas for other things in in this jewelry collection, but. Um, but who knows, belts, handbags. I mean, I have <laughs> ideas for everything. My mind never stops. I heard you, and I'm going to let you go because you said you have two children at home. I don't know how you take care of them, but uh, you're on the go. I'm on the go all the time. So good luck to you, Thank and thanks you. for being with us. Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with A.J. Jamal. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with actor, comedic talent, A.J. Jamal. He already has me laughing. <laughs> as a matter, uh, as a native of Cleveland, Ohio, his first career move was an engineer for IBM computers. It wasn't long before A.J. realized this was not a good life plan. Welcome, A.J. Thank you. Thank and you why much. was uh, computers so off-putting? Well, number one, uh, it was the wrong thing for me to be in. I, I decided to go into engineering because uh, at the time my high school college girlfriend she was going to be a doctor she's going like what are you going to be and I was like I'm going to be a bum <laughs> she says well, I'm not marrying no bum I go well, what do you want me to be she says uh, something like a lawyer engineer I go okay I'll be an engineer and then I, did you go to school and I went to engineering school while <laughs> she was studying yeah and did she become a doctor she's a doctor now and I'm a comedian did you marry her <laughs> did okay. you marry her no, my father was like, wait a minute, you left a doctor to do comedy, you left engineering, you left a doctor, you're on a, you're on a good move. Yeah, that, now <laughs> you're ready. So how did you make the move from computers into well, I comedy, was, comedy, comedy? Well, I was, uh, of course, a lot of comedians, they got the same story as far as I was class clown, oh, and I always like to play jokes and everything, and I, I followed that same trend. And then IBM had, uh, they were noticing a lot of, press with me uh, doing comedy and they were saying and we didn't know you did comedy on the side I go yeah they said well you know it seemed like you probably have a future and it. you ever thought about doing it for a time and I go I, I couldn't afford it. you know IBM is where my money comes from and they're saying well you, you're not that good of an engineer and we think you could be a great comedian and I'm like well I can't and they actually helped me get started. They, they this was like pink slipping you out. Right, that, that, that's what they were doing. They were sort of. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Come on, do you want to sponsor it me? Like it's, it seemed like you want me out this company pretty bad. But uh, they were very nice in helping me uh, get started. They gave me a little money to pay bills and. Did they? Oh, for that sure. That was great. That was well, then it nice. was good to be an engineer. That old girlfriend was right. She was right. She it helped me get started in comedy. Exactly. Were you uh, doing? Uh, stand up or practicing your routines while you were still working for yes, IBM? Yes, I started, uh, and actually 86 I left IBM. So I started doing a little amateur stuff in uh, 85, and 86 I decided, okay, let me make the big move. And I think I, I worked the road um, headlining clubs after about a year of um, just working in Cleveland. So now 
I said, it's time for me to make my move to Los Angeles. So after a year and a half, I moved out here. Well, where did you practice? And who taught you how to do these routines? I mean, here you well, were playing with your computers and <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. Well, in actuality, Cleveland has a few comedy clubs and they have like open mics, amateur. That's what I tell any young oh. comic who's interested in getting into comedy. Go to some of the comedy clubs because they actually have nights for amateurs and uh, people to work on their routine. And, Did uh, you write it all yourself and then go to open mic? Oh yeah, I would write. I would write. I, I never thought I could take someone else's thoughts and make them funny. And I thought, uh, you know, the things I had up in my head, let me put that on paper and try it. And Did you have a role model so that you were trying to get your routine the same way? It, actuality, because uh, a lot of people ask who, you know, who did you like when you were coming up? And a lot of people don't know this comic, but he's, he's pretty funny. Franklin Ajay, he's in uh, this thing called Car Wash. He was in uh, Neil I Diamonds. I know him. Yeah, he's very funny. A-J-A-Y-E. Right, that's I his name, <laughs> Franklin Ajay. And uh, I used to always listen to Franklin Ajay, and I thought he was so clever, you know, and I'd say, I want to be like Franklin Ajay. And David Seinfeld was another one I thought was, you know, clever in that right. So uh, those, those are the com comedians I was following. Some, you talk about doing stand-up comedy, and you also, or, or we, we'll talk about doing stand-up comedy, mm -hmm. and doing uh, an opening for, say, Diana Ross, or Cher, right. or Kenny Loggins, which you've done. Right. Um, major stars. What's the difference between just standing up in a comedy club and doing your own comedy, or opening for an act? Well, well, number one, I, I enjoy working with the artists because I get a free concert. <laughs> I get a couple of comp tickets and I'm in a concert. Good stuff. And, uh, and it's just the magnitude. I was with um, Cher at the Spectrum, and it's like you come on stage to 20,000 people. You know they're not there to see you, but there's 20,000 people listening and versus you're going to a comedy club where there's 300 people. And with uh, you have to tailor your act a little different. Like Diana Ross there's certain things. Um, she would prefer you not to do. And oh, does so she tell uh, what, you ahead of time? Well, she doesn't really tell you. She says if she doesn't like the act, you're gone. No, uh, <laughs> no <laughs> that's, but how that's do you... a subtle hit. No. But do you no, meet with her or with her people ahead with the, of time? With her people, they just want to know if... Um, and I can understand because certain comics, you know how they'll go to the audience and they'll put down the audience for a laugh? Well, um, you know, she prefer you not to just put down her audience, which I'm not that kind of comic, so I never had a problem. So once they saw my act, they said, well, he's clean, he, you know, he, he goes out and he, he's doing his act and he's not worried about the audience and, you know, for three and a half years I was working with him. So is that a, a difficult uh, job to get, opening big headline shows? Well, if you're with certain agents that have that roster where, um, like I was with uh, William Morris at the time, uh -huh. and they had um, big stars on the roster, you know, so I could go out with the Temptations oh, because I they were see. with the agency. I see, I see. So. Well, when did acting come along? Uh, was, was comedy <laughs> off-putting or was acting off-putting then? Because you went into living color right. and in a situation well, comedy. Well, in actuality, my acting is still coming along. <laughs> You go from engineering to comedy to acting, it's like uh, a lot at one time. So I'm taking my acting and um, I thought it was an opportunity, because in Living Color it's situation comedy, it's not like drama. So you can sort of be yourself. So when uh, I was hired in as a regular on In Living Color, which was the last season, uh, it gave me room to actually develop my acting while I was being A.J. Jamal. Did you go to acting on. school? I'm starting to take some acting classes. So you didn't really do it. No. You just used it. <laughs> just, I just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I showed up. And then you have people like David Allen Greer, Jamie Foxx, who, you know, very talented. And, they, you know, they coach you here and coach you there and help you out here and there. Oh, so, but that's really great because it's like your peers telling right, you what right. to do. When um, you left in loving, in loving Color, in, in living, loving color. <laughs> you like In Loving Color, In Living Color, right. um, you had another career move already. Well, well there's an opportunity as far as uh, hosting my own show on the Comedy Central channel, and which is a uh, fairly new Comedy uh, Central. It's only two years old. And I thought that was, that was a good opportunity where I'd come out, interview celebrity guests like Jesse Jackson, Arsenio, Magic Johnson, and then I introduced comedians. and uh, Were those had, straight interviews or were they, oh, they funny were, interviews? No, they're very straight. As a matter of fact, a lot of the, the guests were like, I thought this is a comedy show. You're making me tense. Because yeah. I would say, what do you think about world hunger? What do you think about AIDS? What do you think about But you know, Dr. Racism? Jackson can answer anything. He's oh, so uh, great. <laughs> Jesse, well, I think that world, he just go off into whatever. <laughs> 
You can say that. hamburger. Hamburger? I think that hamburger need cheese, <laughs> need mustard, ketchup. He goes off into anything. He's isn't so it? great, isn't he? Oh, I mean, fantastic. he must be a great interview. Great interview. He's a, 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 you know, very knowledgeable, and that's the one thing I, I appreciate. A lot of people I was talking to, I was even shocked at the knowledge that they have, like John Singleton from Boys in the Hood and uh, Poetic Justice. A young, he's a very young brother, just graduated, I think it was a USC, and but he has so much knowledge. And you sit there and you're looking at going, he really studies his craft. And I, I appreciate that. You know. But professional knowledge you're talking about. Exactly. Let's see a clip from, I don't know what you brought, but. Well, something from Comic Justice. Okay, we'll see that. Things I've been thinking about. I was reading the paper, man, because I got that kind of time. Bosnia, why is America always helping out other countries? We help out everybody. I was, did you read with Bosnia? You heard about, she like, Bosnia, is that off of Hofstede? <laughs> you know, I got lost trying to find Bosnia. I was trying to get my salon appointment. I, I'm glad you told me what Bosnia was at. Get my head touched. <laughs> That's a country over by the Sylvia Union. We sending them, we sending them food. The, these are the same people that want to bomb America one year. Now we sending them food. You know why the only reason they didn't bomb us? Because they was hungry. <laughs> now, I don't mind us helping out places like Somalia. You know, that's a good cause. Because they, 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 yeah. you know, things to make you think. What, and about that Somalia deal, why are we giving them rice and grain? <laughs> Kick some grain out of the airplane, just poof. You hungry, you want a sandwich. <laughs> some large fries, something to drink, a shake. Kick me out a Happy Meal. <laughs> I'll do some grain. Like I'm sitting and go, woo, we grain, woo. So, does this show have a PG or an R rating? Oh, this show is very PG. And uh, that's the one thing I like about the show, being that uh, my comedy is considered PG, clean comedy. And uh, the comedians, they'll come on and we say, if you have anything topical to talk about, you know, you could go ahead and talk about something topical. And uh, they already know in the beginning not to use four-letter words or whatever. You, you decided that early on in your career that that was the way you wanted to go? Oh, my mother would hit me upside the head if she, <laughs> if she heard me say anything that looked like it was a bad word, wop. Well, do you think you can get just as much laughter out of your audience that way? Yes, I think Either you way. can. Either way? I think you can. I think uh, it's a little more work. You have to sit down and say, how do you segue from this bit of material to this bit of material without using a four-letter word or without just using the word to throw in. And uh, sometimes a lot of comedians, you know, even like a Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, even when they said four-letter words or something like that, it has substance more so than some of the young comics uh, that you are just, just out there saying, and you're saying, well, why are they even cursing? You know, it's not even funny. It's just like filling in the time. Exactly. It's more like filling in the time. So I think if you're constructive with what you're doing, because I was watching George Carlin the other night, and I, I noticed, uh, you know, he has certain choice words, but, you know, he's hitting his points. And Comic Justice, did you name the show? No, uh, I wanted to call it 411 A.J. Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> I Information. Thought AJ, I thought A.J. Jamal was a very good name for a comedy show. <laughs> I see. <laughs> that would have been a good one, right? Right, that would have been a good one. 411, you gave all the information. Information, A.J. Was, Jamal is 411. Yeah. But I uh, know uh, and Andre Wiseman, Mark Atkins are the actual um, um, producers, and they named the show. Um, you wanted your show to have some information, topical things. How, how does a person like you go about informing your audience and still keeping a light vein? Well, uh, what you do is like if you're talking about homelessness, for a homelessness, uh, I'll come out and I'll say something like, you know, something that's funny, but it, it hits this point. Like, if you're not really homeless, don't be out there with the fake signs. I, I saw a guy in Beverly Hills with not only will work for food, but he had what food he wanted. Baked <laughs> potato, the steak, <laughs> and the soup of the day. And, you know, you say something like that, and then you get to the serious issue. Well, we do have a problem with homelessness, and we and should address can, it. Right. And then you can get people thinking, even though you bring them in on a, a comic level, then you can... And you get them to think. So I think that works well.
um, your show is taped in Chicago, I think, is it? It's, we taped the first 13 episodes out of Chicago, but what we're trying to do, we're trying to get different locations so we can bring in you know, different comedians, different themes. So we're in Chicago. The next 13 episodes we're going to tape in December, uh, and it'll be right here in L.A. So d do you think it makes a difference where you're taping? Does that change your feeling about the show? Just a little, you know, not really, because, you know, being that I'm the host and I'll come out and I have my monologue, but it, it gives a flavor, whereas Chicago, I was talking about the ale, people relate to uh. the, um, you know, downtown Chicago, or here, I may talk about something like Sunset Hollywood. That's what like I wondered, that. yeah. Um, one of the quotes was, your style is a blend of theatrical range and versatil versatility. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Well, because I have a little music, a little uh. singing, uh, I'm also doing some characters, uh, I imitate my father, and then I'm always moving around on stage. So it's not like I come to the microphone and I go, well, this is my story, oh, I see. this is this. I'm running around stage, I'm jumping, I'm spinning. Sometimes I just do a complete spin with no reason. So being versatile is because you were a musician and you also were a dancer. Yeah, <laughs> a dancer like ballet. <laughs> were now, you? <laughs> I was a dancer, but not like uh, someone paid me money. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I, I was in the clubs like, hey, that's a... <laughs> so is that on my resume? He's a dancer. <laughs> well, it said you were a dancer, but I, and you, you do use all of these talents in your yeah. show. Well, I, I have a, a, a little rhythm. Let's just say a little rhythm. <laughs> uh, I'm a dancer. <laughs> I'm going to be on the Madonna tour in Vogue. And, no, uh, I, I like to dance, and maybe that's what they're talking about, and I move a lot on stage. Did you ever think of being a musician before we leave instead of a comic? I was, I was actually a, mu a musician, you know, and I, uh, I couldn't play. <laughs> just like I was a bad engineer, I was a bad musician. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to just stick with comedy. And we're going to stick with that, too, and we're going to leave. Thanks, AJ, for <laughs> well, thank being you very with much. us, and thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll see you next time.